Welcome to Leave No Doubt. I'm joined by Byron Webster. Byron, thank you for being here. How are you doing? Very good, yourself? Very good, thank you. So, we'll get straight in. Yeah. To get us started, mate, I want to talk to you about your first experiences of football as a young guy. Um, 17 years old, I think it's very relatable for, for a lot of young players, hopefully listening to this podcast. You made your debut for York in the conference, which is now known as the National League. Um, and a lot of guys that age might be unhappy that, you know, that they started their career at that level. Um, they might be unhappy that they aren't involved in academy environments or, or making debuts for football league clubs. You've gone on to have, you know, an amazing career, but started off in non-league. How important is it, do you think, for young people at that level to understand that everybody has different journeys, everybody has different paths, and if you're not playing professional football at that age, that, that doesn't mean that your career is over. It's massive, and I can see it even more now, playing in the conference at my age now. Um, there's so many young, talented footballers at this level that, you know, you need a chance. Football is a lot of luck. You, do, you know, there's a lot of players with a lot of talent, but you need that luck. You need the luck to be mainly for someone to get injured in your position. Injured in your position or suspended, and then, and then you get your chance. Um, like you say, for me, I don't know if it's because I was at York City for such a long time. I loved it there. So I was happy. It was a good academy, or centre of excellence, what they were called back then. Um, we had like Jonathan Greening, who went on to play for Man United, um, Fulham, so on. Richard Creswell. So us growing up, it was always like, we want to be what they're doing. Um, and yeah, like you said, 17, I was making my debut, playing against men still as a kid and, and enjoyed it a lot. So what do you think the massive difference is between, obviously you're finishing uh, arguably the latter years of your career in, the, in National League. What are the difference is that you can see now from when you first started off in, at this level? <laughs> Definitely more <laughs> more talent. Back then it was, the pitches were like cow pitches uh, or cow fields. Um, there were a lot of older players coming to the end of their career who were just for a pay day. They were there, they were fat, they were overweight. They were, you, know, the, you could still see they had the talent. Um, but now it's more, like I said, there's a lot more talented young kids, um, a lot more savvy managers, you know, good managers in this league. Um, and at the end of the day, there's chairmen's club owners who want to progress to get into the football league to get more cash. So, you know, I'd say it's, it's improved, you know, leaps and bounds. So for young guys, obviously starting their careers at this level, do you say it's, it's a, almost a positive because they'll be playing obviously at men's level like you were, that it could arguably end up being a, a good thing that they're at this level so young? Definitely. Not just because of how they are as football players and playing games helps you progress your career, but I think it sets you up in good stead for later on in career. You, you've, you've started at the bottom as such. So you've started at the bottom and hopefully you've progressed. So when you get to Premiership, Championship, League 1, League 2, whatever it is, you see an improvement. You don't take things for granted. Whereas I believe... If you start at the top, for instance, you're a, a sport Man United, so I'll use that as an example. Man United, they get everything as young kids. So when they drop down, they expect that. So when the standard might be, not be as high as that, I believe they find it harder. And that's why more people who start at the top filter out of the game. I think there's a lot more players who start at the bottom and progress the way through and they have a longevity in the game. So what happened with you, we'll get on to your story, mate, when you obviously made your debut as 17 years old uh, and played for a couple of years, obviously had quite a lot of experience, quite a lot of first team exposure. Um, but then the research that I have done with you is that you, you, you sort of contemplated stopping playing at sort of 19, 18, 19. Yeah. You, you, you had a decision to make on your career. What sort of happened in that period of time? So, uh, yeah, so like I say, I was at York City for a long time, grew up there, knew all the players, the staff, everything. Um Chris Brass was a manager at the time he was playing player manager um, and he got injured, I think he did his ACL, um, came off, obviously I came on his position from 17 until I think it was, I played the half of that year and maybe a bit of the start of the next season. So say for a season, I was flying, I was I was doing well, never was one of them to get above my stations, I carried away, my dad had knocked me down and you know chill out, um, there were no agents around so you weren't getting your head full with with rubbish. But then a manager came in, Billy McEwen. There's two managers I've fallen out with, Billy McEwen and Eddie Boothroyd, and I can't say a good word about either of them. Uh, Billy McEwen came in and he was just a bully. Um, looking back now, I can see it affected me 
back then I'm thinking, nah, he didn't affect me. I weren't bothered. It's, you know, I, you know, but looking back for me to be thinking about contemplating finishing football, it definitely affected me. Um, I weren't strong enough, probably mentally, um, to get through it. And yeah, so I, what is it? The easy road. I, I kind of, yeah, contemplated quitting. So it was kind of one of them that, you know, I, I had interest in football. I weren't enjoying it. And I've always been one of them. All my dad and mum and dad have always said, if you don't enjoy something, don't do it. Go on to something else. But to be fair to my dad, my dad uh, said, stick at it. And then, yeah, went back over to the Czech Republic, or went to the Czech Republic and fell back in love with the game. What was it about, you know, that mental challenge, maybe looking back on it now that you found most difficult? I just think it was because I was playing, everything was all rosy. I'd never been in a situation where, you like to swear on here? If you like. Yeah, where the shit had hit the fan. So there was no experience. I didn't know how to deal with a bad situation. It weren't necessarily that my football form dipped. It was just the fact that my face didn't fit with him. And he was a, a big, angry Scotsman who, you know, was, he was just, yeah, aggressive. He was rude. He was, he was everything. Um, and I just didn't know how to deal with it. Looking back now at my career, playing for clubs I played for, i.e. Millwall, it's put me in good stead because literally they could say, anyone could say anything about me and I'd class myself as bulletproof. Um, but that moment in time, because I hadn't been through it, I didn't know how to deal with it. A lot of young guys we're seeing at the moment, and it happens at the top level, and pundits talk about it, you know, managers are talking about it, how you can talk about players, how you can treat them, you know, that players are now more sensitive and they, they need to be treated a certain way. Obviously, you're talking about not being treated that way as a young kid and, and finding it quite challenging. How important is it that young guys know that getting into football is going to be a challenge mentally? And, and how important is it that they learn how to deal with that? I don't think we're giving young, young players a chance in the game because we don't, we, we mollycoddle them. We don't tell them straight. You're not allowed to tell them straight. You, you have to dress it up. You need to sugarcoat things. It don't matter what player you are, if you're higher leagues, lower leagues or whatever, fans are going to hammer you. It don't matter how good you are. Ronaldo or Messi, they get hammered. There's an opinion on them. Football fans, you know, they buy a ticket, they're allowed to say whatever they want to you. We, as clubs, as players, as staff, as coaches, we don't tell people the truth because we're scared of hurting feelings. We're scared of the repercussions. And that's what it is now. We're not saying we want to bully players, but there is a way the old mentality was, we'll make them tough. You know, little things from, we did jobs, didn't, well, you know, you did jobs as a YTS. You know, you um, you go by a first team pro, good morning. You know, and then you'd go home and you'd be like, oh, dad, I, I said hi to blah, blah this morning. And he's buzzing. Now the kids, their heads are down. They don't say hi. They don't do any jobs. And it's big clusters. Well, I think it was the FA that stopped it all. For me, it sets you up in good stead for when you get to the first team, you have standards, you, you've earned your stripes as such. But going back to speaking truthfully and open to players, that won't happen now. It just won't happen. So obviously see that times have changed now and those things don't happen. How can, in your opinion, now, young guys prepare for the mental challenge that football is going to bring them? It'll just be when they get thrown into the first team and they'll sink or swim. And I think that's why... The lower leagues are getting so much better because some players can't deal with it. Mental health is a massive thing, and I think that's not saying a problem, but because you can't be so open with people and tell them the truth, if you have a bad game and you know you tell them that you've had a bad game, you need to, people are not worried. They, they're cautious of how that person's going to react to it. Um. And there's no right or wrong way because it, the manager's going to abuse you or the fans are going to abuse you. Are we going to help the players by toughening them up as such? That doesn't mean, like I say, bullying them, but being, being on, just being honest. Um, and it, it lands at the players' feet in a, in a nutshell. They have to be able to take the criticism. And, and, you know, how it was with me was, all right, I'll show you. You know, you've said that opinion about me. I'll, I'll, I'll prove you wrong. Now, like I say, because you, you can't be so hard, so firm, 
it literally it's going to be you, you get into the first team, you're playing in front of X amount of thousand of fans, and and when they do abuse you, you need to have a strong mentality. I don't know how it's gonna how it's gonna work. I'm interested to know a little bit more about the the period of time that you had a decision to make about your future. I know obviously you touched on that your dad told you to stick at it, but I think it's so relatable for young guys at the moment, especially 16, 17, 18, 19, who are making a decision between are they going to pursue football that may or may not obviously to to work out for them, or are they going to pursue school that's going to end up long term being a you know being a decision for their yeah. either career whatever they want. What sort of mindset were you in going through that process, and how did you ultimately, as alongside obviously your dad, uh, uh, your dad's advice, how did you make the decision to to stick with football? To stick with football, it, it, it was my dad. It literally just down to him. He was like, "You will regret it. You've got talent. Just go and give it a go." Um, so then, when the opportunity, in fact, I was on a holiday, and in it, in I think it was an agent or someone rang my dad to see if I wanted to go over to the Czech Republic. And my dad booked my flight and I was going. He's never been a forceful person like you're doing it. This time you're going. Because I weren't bothered, I was just, I went over there, I was relaxed, no pressure. If it works out, it works out. And it, it worked out. If it hadn't have worked out, I don't know what the hell I'd have done. Because yet again, my parents were massive on go to school, get your grades. It's a meal ticket. No one can ever take it away from you. So I got on my GCSEs, went to college, did. I think it was Nas- B Tech National Diploma, something like that. So I've got all that to fall back on, but I hated school. I don't know what job I'd have done. Um, but yeah, I think I went over there relaxed. I weren't bothered, and and it worked out the best best decision ever. You just said I went over. You know, someone called my dad. I went to the Czech Republic. Like it's not a big deal. Yeah. You, <laughs> for people obviously listening to this podcast that that might think that is a bit strange, you are the only Englishman to have ever played in that league. So how did that? come about like for, imagine I'm a young guy now I think oh I'm not sure whether school or football and then suddenly you get a call from the Czech Republic how did that happen like what what was you going through then I, honestly Joe looking back I didn't think I just didn't think about it it was like I'm gonna go and do it if it works out it works out I don't know how to explain I don't know if because of the situation at York what happened where like I say I'd gone through highs and a low it was just yeah I'll go but who was it that got in touch with you to I honestly couldn't tell you I don't know it was it, it I don't it, my dad's always said that an agent got in contact with him um, how they got my dad's number I don't know my dad could be waffling and he might have wrote to the club and said look can my son come out um, I never actually pulled him up on it I might have to actually do that but yeah it was just a, a unique situation where there was nothing to lose but everything to gain um, and like I say it was Looking back, it's the best decision ever. And I would also say to younger players, if they get, well, a lot are doing it now, going over to Germany, going over to Belgium, Holland. If you get the opportunity to play football wherever, um, then then take it. Because it, honestly, it's, it, it's massive. You learn not only about football, but how to live. You know, I'd gone over there on my own. I'm living in a flat, never done my washing, never done cooking. Uh, and I have to learn. You have to, you have to survive. So in football in terms then, obviously, because hopefully these conversations that we have on this podcast are going to allow to people to improve their own football. Give us an insight into what football in Czech Republic looks like. That's why I would say I'm not a typical head and kick it player. I can head and kick it, but it just, it was a lot more tactical, a lot more technical on about keeping the ball, retaining it, composure. Um, when I first, when the team, Bannock Moss, when I was over there, were playing in the the First league, I don't know what it's classed as, uh, yeah, the championship, like the Premier League of the Czech Republic. Uh, so we were playing against big teams, Sparta, Prague, Slavia, Prague, Boleslav, um, Ostrava, who have all been in the Champions League. So like we were playing against big players. I remember um, Thomas Repka, do you remember him who was at West Ham? He came over, um, obviously when he'd finished at West Ham and he was playing. There, there was It was great, really good standard, mental fans. Um and yeah, it was, it was just good football. It was different football to the conference at York City where it was well, someone whacking you all the time. There were more technical things of how to foul, how to slow games down. And it was good. It was a big learning curve for me. How difficult was it for you to go over there and, like you say, learn a language, you know, get into the environment of, of what life looked like over there? get into the environment of what football looked like. How difficult was that? 
It was, but the club were fantastic. The club were really good. Um, in the team I had, um, Moss, there was a lot of um, different f- foreigners as such. So there was the French lads, there was a couple of Brazilian lads, a Kenyan, um, Argentinian, and then obviously the Czech boys. There was a divide. It was like the Czech lads and then the, the foreigners. Um, but... The Czech boys, as long as you could show that you were trying to fit into their country, their culture, they did take you in. So, like, the club put us put Czech lessons on. We had to go to Czech lessons, I think it was twice or three times a week. Um, so, yeah, you pick up the swear words rather quick. Um, and then it was just learning to start off with right, left, man on, things like that, which would help us on the pitch. All the Czech lads spoke English, but they didn't let on that they knew that that they could understand you, um, which was quite funny sometimes. But, yeah, it was difficult. Like I said, on the field, communicating, simple things was hard. Um, but like I said, off it was difficult. I'd gone, I think I was, must have been 18, 19 when I went over there. And it's just like, you're on your own. You, you're in a flat on your own. You, like I said, cooking, cleaning, which is a simple thing, but as a young kid, it's not. And then what do you do with your time? We don't train for long. We train a couple of hours a day and then you're back to the flat. You go shopping, you go for a walk, do whatever. And yeah, I've, and that was the reason I came back to England just because boredom set in and it was kind of like, right, well, I've enjoy, I'm enjoying football now. Now I want to try and get back into England. So in a strange way, obviously you've gone from York in, in a National League level as a young guy to playing in the Czech Republic, which most people would think is absolutely mental, but... For any other young player right now thinking of or being offered an opportunity to go and play in a foreign country, wherever that might be, from your experiences, what do they need to be aware of? What do they need to be ready for? Firstly, they need to make sure they're going to a good club. They need to make sure they're going to a good club where, I, like I had an apartment sorted, a car sorted, I knew I was going to get paid. You know, they're the main worries. Main worries for a parent, I'd say. That was my mum and dad's problem. Is that okay? And then after that, it's just it's just making sure you enjoy your football. I'm a big believer that a football career is a short career. You need to enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, then then just pack it in, whatever standard. Um, and yeah, set yourself targets. That's whether you're abroad or you're in England. You know, my target was to enjoy football. As soon as I enjoyed football, now my next challenge was to get back to England and see if I could pro- progress in the English game. I'm also interested to know going back a little bit, obviously before the, the Czech Republic experience, you're talking about your father, obviously your parents that have a massive influence on, on, on you and allowed you to almost make those decisions. But how can people playing at non-league level, mostly non-league level, with aspirations of having a career in football, but are possibly surrounded by people that don't share those aspirations? So maybe a parent is saying, I'm not sure you should continue with playing football. Maybe you should start studying a little bit yeah. more or, or, or concentrate on something else. How can they commit to their ambition and make that reality? That's a, yet again, I'd say that's from within. Um, my dad had the similar situation when he was growing up. He was on the Huddersfield books, got offered, um, I think it was pro contract. And his dad said, nah, not many people make it as a footballer. And he went into the printing industry. You know, that's one of his main regrets. You need to believe in yourself. You have to believe. Um, because it, whether it's a parent or other people, there'll always be someone there to say, no, nah, you won't do it. You ain't going to do it. The, only a small percentage of people do it. Why can't it be you? Why, Why? you know, if you, you've got two legs, you bet as good as everyone else, or go and have a crack, go and do it. Um, yeah, that's it really. You just have to believe. I think it's just belief. So the... You're saying obviously boredom set in when you finished it in the Czech, but you had to come back and you had to go on trial. Trial processes, obviously, in this country and at whatever level, for some reason, are uh, perceived as being possibly a negative experience. Like I was a trialist, mm. and if that ends up in you being offered a deal with the with the club, the deals are often bad because I was just a trialist. The trialist is coming in, or the perception. And the rest of the team on a trial list, you know what it's like when they say, oh, he's, he's just there on trial. Even if he signed, oh, he was there on trial. Why is it perceived in, in such a negative way, do you think? I think business-wise for the club, they know that, oh, well, he's, he's desperate. He needs a club. 
so they're going to offer you a rubbish deal. Um, and then as players looking in it, oh, this lad's in on trial, it's yet again, well, he ain't got a club, so he can't be that good. I just think that it's a mindset of if he was decent, he'd have a club. So he needs us more than we need him. So if it works out, it's positive for the club. Maybe we can sell him on. If he's good, then he's going to progress the team. Um, so, yeah, I just think it's a trial list doesn't hold all the cards. But I mean, you had a successful trial. And when we talk about trial lists, I mean, like I, I in particular, I played with a guy, um, Billy Bowden, who one day, if we can get him, will be on his podcast, who many Bristol Rovers players who played with him end up saying he's the best player I've played with. He's the most talented. He moved from Bristol Rovers to Preston, but he came to Rovers on a pre-season trial. So he had to go through that period and obviously ended up being the best player by, by a mile. So that perception of, of obviously being a trialist, um, how do you think that people in the position of going on trial can approach that to obviously end up progressing their career instead of just being, oh, I'm, I'm going to be so happy if I just get in this team? Yeah, it, It's a weird one, isn't it? Because us as players, we all know what everyone thinks. Even the trialist knows what everyone's thinking. Um, how he deals with it is, yet again, confidence. Confidence and belief that, yeah, I'm a trialist. What, so what? You know, how many players do we know at a team that are just there because they know the manager? The manager's taking them to every club. It doesn't mean they're a good player. So the trialists coming in, as long as they have the bit between the teeth, too right they're going to show them. Billy Bowden, I've played against him a number of times, unbelievable player. Um, but football, like I say, football is about luck and self-confidence. You have to believe. You, you really do. Because if you don't believe, no one else will believe in you. Football is all about opinions, and no one has the same opinion. Managers swap and change all the time. You could be playing week in, week out for one manager. New manager comes in and you push to one side. No explanation, just you don't want you playing. So as a trialist, as long as you do everything <laughs> in your own power, then hopefully the manager likes you. But in a nutshell, if he doesn't like you or he's heard stories about you or whatever, you're done for. It's just, football is a small world where... Everyone knows everything. How did you approach your trial period then when you went to Doncaster? So the talk, mine was a lucky one because in the Czech we had um, like winter break, so it was fantastic. We'd have like two two months off. Um, so I remember I wanted to leave in the the Christmas time and I thought I was going to Motherwell. Um, all agreed, but they couldn't agree a fee. So after that, I went and trained with um, Berry because Chris Brass was there. Yeah, again, people you know from in football just to get in there. So I went and trained at Berry. Um, knew nothing had come up from there. But then when it came to the summer, I went and played. Yet yeah, again, I, I weren't going back to the Czech Republic. I've been naughty. I told them I weren't going back. Um, I'll, I, you know, I still had a contract, but I was kicking up a stinker. So um, yeah, went and trained at Berry. We played a pre-season friendly. I think it was against either Et we played against Everton, and I think we played against Doncaster. Um, Doncaster saw me um, and then invited me over to train for two weeks. So it was all luck. It really was. I knew Brassy from York City, went into Bury, played a pre-season friendly, and then Sean O'Driscoll invited me over. I did a, a week or two weeks trial there, and then, yeah, they agreed a fee. And, and, and then I was there signing there. So what advice would you give to anybody who's been offered a trial as to how to prepare for that experience? Take it. First of all, take it. And secondly, yeah, everyone thinks you're rubbish. <laughs> everyone thinks you're rubbish because you're on trial and you have nothing to lose. So just go in there, as my dad says, puff your chest out and be you. And that, that is all that can happen. If you're good enough, you'll be there. And if, you, if, if that person, that manager says you're not good enough, it's only his opinion. You know, there's plenty more managers who will have a different opinion. Is there a wrong way to approach a trial? Yeah, as a player, and I, you're, you're smiling, I think you're going to say, if someone comes in and they're a loud mouth and they're too much and they're too full of themselves, the lads ain't going to have you. And <laughs> we had someone um, a bit ago who came in and I've, he came in and a great lad, lots of talent, but he was too loud, too full of himself. And as soon as he messed up in training, 
you jump on him like anything, don't you? And he, he, didn't, he didn't shirk. He kept being loud. Mm. But, yeah, I just say if you're too loud, just go there. Don't go under the radar. Be you. Don't be anything false. We're talking about how trialists should approach that experience and how mentally and physically they can obviously um, go into that experience. But I'm going to flip it, that question, and say, as players who are already signed at clubs, how, in your opinion, obviously, as the captain of this club right now, how, in your opinion, should players approach treating trialists? It's a tough one because... I don't think any of us are nasty people, not just here at many clubs. There's not many nasty players, nasty people, but it's a dog-eat-dog world. If someone's coming in as a centre-half, you're going to be nice to him, but you're also going to be hoping he's not very good or he's going to mess up because potentially he's going to take your position. That means you ain't going to get your bonuses, you ain't going to be playing, you don't play, then what's going to happen after that? We're all worrying about if, buts and maybes. If a trialist comes in who's a striker and he's a really nice guy, happy days, because he doesn't affect me. Um, us as footballers, we're very selfish. We worry about ourselves, even though it's a team game. Um, so, yeah, I don't think... You, you're not going to be nasty to them, but you're definitely going to be wary and, and a bit cautious if they're in your position. Throughout your career, obviously... Signed for Doncaster on trial, started playing and in the professional game. But throughout your career, you've been such an important part of a lot of teams. Um, you've been part of Yeovil's most successful ever team. Um, you were an important part of Millwall getting promoted back into the championship. Obviously, both via the playoffs, which is incredibly difficult. Um, you know, I was I was involved. I'm going to say it was involved. I didn't really play in successful teams, but I was there. So I obviously have seen a lot of, of what it takes to be to be part of that. Um, what do you think it was about you, though, that allowed you to, to be as heavily involved in those teams as you were? I go back to the York City days where, as a youth team player, you were given a responsibility of something simple, cleaning balls, cleaning poles, whatever it was. It set me in good stead. I knew that if I was looking after the balls or cleaning your boots, I had to I had to do it. If I didn't do it, I was going to get told off for it. So then when you get further up the ladder, you're, you, you've, you've earned your stripes. You've got to where you want to be. So then when it comes to setting standards within a team, it might not be cleaning boots, but if someone isn't training well, I have no problem in saying, listen, oi, pull your finger out. And I, I, like I said, I go back to the York City days. It has to be where, as a youth team player, you were told. You were just told straight. So that's, gro- that's instilled in me now that when I'm playing, um, I will tell people straight. I'm not a nasty person. There's, there's not many players who say I'm a nasty person. I'm a nice guy. But I think you know, if I speak, I'm speaking with a bit of authority and I'm speaking with maybe a bit of experience. Um, So, yeah, so when I was in those successful teams, it wasn't just me. We had a lot of players who who had had good careers and who drove the team. And I think the older you get, other players respect if you've done more in the game, if that makes sense. So, say, for instance, now at Bromley, I've had a couple of promotions. So, the younger lads, if I say something to them, they're going to do it. Just because they think, oh, Byron, he's got promotion, this, he's been there, he's done that. Whereas if, for instance, another younger lad asked them to do it, they probably wouldn't, rightly or wrongly. That's just how it is. But, yeah, it was the same. At Millwall, we had Steve Morrison. He could have told me to jump off a bridge I'd have done it because it's who he was. He, he'd done so much that if he said to jump off a bridge, well, obviously it's going to make us win, so I'm going to do it. Um, so, yeah, I, there's, there's that. Like I say, going back to York City, earning my stripes... Doing it the, the hard way, so like I was saying before, when I've started at the bottom and I've got all the way up to the top, you know, I'd, I've gone through everything. I've done all the rubbish. So if I've done it, then a younger lad or another player, they, you're going to do it. You know, I'm going to drag you through it. We're going to get through it. And, and, and that's where the success comes through. So I'm interested. I want to try and break your football ability, your football career, what you, obviously, the, the way you grew into the player that you are now. 
I'm going to try and break that down into a little bit of detail for people listening. So when you were obviously in these successful teams, Yeovil, Millwall, what was happening in your football lifestyle? How were you preparing? Um, how were you training? What sort of extras were you doing? Um, what was your nutrition like, your sleep like? I mean, obviously we can get through them all. It's a long question, but what, how was your football lifestyle? Like, how did you, how did you become so successful? Um, nothing one the same. I, we'll go, we'll, like I say, we'll break it down. So to start off with family, when I was at Yeovil, my family lived with me. Um, so at that time I had my, obviously my wife, my daughter, and my little boy was born the last year I was at Yeovil. So he'd just come out, just come there. So yeah, two two successful clubs, Yeovil and Millwall. Going to Millwall at the start where it wasn't going successful, I had my family with me. And then I thought I was moving back up north so, and my daughter was going to school. Um, so they moved back up north. I actually stayed down in London and got success. So there's two differences. My family was with me and then they're not. So <laughs> that's another similarity. I don't know... What it was there, it, that didn't affect me, mainly because, like I say, maybe because I've been in the Czech Republic. I'd been in the Czech Republic, even though I didn't have my wife then, I'd speak to my family all the time, there's first time, so it, it was happy days, it worked. Um, lifestyle, listen, I like a night out, but I've never been a big drinker. I, I don't drink at home, I don't, I, for me personally, I don't see the point in sitting down watching TV and having one glass of wine. Uh, if I go out, I'll have a few beers and I will really enjoy enjoy my night. Um, but yeah, I look after myself that way. Uh, food as well. I, I'm not a big takeaway person, maybe because I'm tight, <laughs> tight and and I don't like to waste money that way. Um, my wife's a good cook, so um, so yeah. So we'll eat at home a lot of the time, and especially now with the kids, um, you know, we're always eating at home and and, and eating that way. Um, and then training wise, I've always trained hard. If that makes in training, if a training session's there for an hour, two hours long, I'm going to give my all in that that two hours. Um, as you get older, you need to manage that a bit more. But I've never been one for doing a lot of extras, which is crazy. At Yeovil, we did a lot of uh, Terry Skiverton was there. Um, he was an ex-defender, so he'd make us do heading and more heading techniques. Because I was a big lad, I never had to worry about winning a header, but little techniques, little tips. Um, the gym, when I was injured at Doncaster, I was really skinny. So they, they put me on a bulking up program. And that is honestly the only time I've committed to doing weights. Um, I did that with Ross Burberry, who's the best sports scientist I've ever worked with. Um and I just I just bulked up. I became massive, and it's gone the other way now. Where if I go in the gym a lot, I'll become too top heavy. So I just kind of now I maintain. I just every so often I'll go in the gym. I'll um do my upper bodies and and things like that. But for me, it's mainly the one thing that I've kept the same is I've always recovered well. I've always looked after myself. I've always, for instance, it sounds stupid, drank water. I've all, I'm a big believer in all the, the myths, the care tape, the uh, massages. You could massage me all day, I'd love it. And I always feel better afterwards. Um, big fan of acupuncture, uh, things like that. So does it work? Maybe not for everyone, but for me, that is the one thing I've kept the same where I've always looked after after training, the recovery of the session. That was the most important thing for you, yeah, recovery. Yeah, yeah, massively. Even for me now. Whereas, like I say, I am, well, you see, I'll go and I'll have a massage. I'll go and see someone for acupuncture. And like I say, it doesn't work for everyone. But for me, I just feel like if I do everything, I'm setting myself up um, to give myself every chance. And that started really when it got even worse, or worse, even better, worse, whichever way you want to look at it, when I did my ACL. Um, I did my ACL and Steve Morrison used to see a guy um, who, he'd be funny, he's called Ronan. He, he, um, he's a glorified masseur, really. All he does is he rips the hell out of your muscles, makes them more elasticated. Um, so, yeah, I went to see him because I always believed that if I didn't see him and I had to come back from my injury and it reoccurred, I'd have, I'd have think, why didn't I just go and see him? Why didn't I spend the extra bit of money just to go and see him? 
uh, went to see him and in a nutshell he was kind of saying how your body works keeps in sync and blah 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 and he, you know, so yeah I went to see him and he intensified everything I do now because he, he broke it down to me your body's a chain so if one bit's tight it pulls on another bit and it affects you so so yeah now I, I have my own massage gun I have the balls hockey balls to roll on elastic bands to stretch just everything recovery for me is massive I know that everybody obviously is different, like you've said, and everybody's body reacts differently to, to to training and recovering. But would you suggest, obviously, to people listening to this who are involved in football that to, to spend a lot more time prioritising recovery? Yeah, recovery. And I'd also say at a younger age, do as much as you can. Do as much. I don't mean just lifting weights. Go doing like your plyometrics, your body weight, weights, pull-ups, sit-ups, things like that. Give yourself every opportunity that way. Because as you get older, we become stubborn, we become robots. Well, I haven't done that throughout my whole career. You know, I feel sore, I feel doms afterwards. If you can do as much as you can as a youngster, start it then. But make sure you recover. Because, like I say, I'm a big believer of injuries. Is That is why. Because we do work our bodies hard. But that two hours of training session is hard it is intense or it should be so if you're just thinking you can just finish training get in your car go home you're deluded you have to be getting your ice baths you have to be getting your stretching even at a younger one because as you get older it's going to get even worse you've been lucky enough obviously to to be exposed to this sort of information obviously you've met different people along the way in your career that have given you different bits and bobs for that you still do to this day as as i'm i see most days where can guys, obviously, without access to, to the information that you have, where can they go to, to get this information? The internet for me is massive. It's even, well, I say it's easier. It's easier if you know where you're looking. Um, like back in my day, there, were, <laughs> there was no YouTube or anything like that. Now, it's, it's easy. It's at, you know, the click of a button. We all saw in the lockdown where, right, the gyms are open. We're going to have to go and have a look online, see what sessions are there. Anything is on YouTube now. Anything. How to stretch, how to get your hips loose, how to get your hamstrings loose. Click into you into yeah, YouTube. And that's the thing I was doing over lockdown. My hips was tightening up from doing the road running all the time. So literally best hip stretches. Twelve minutes, fantastic. So I want to try and break down um each obviously bit of your success with with Yovo and Millwall and, and talk about m- maybe for people listening, how they can recreate those those kind of opportunities because especially Yeovil, for example, that it started off in, in League Two and ended up in the championship, which is genuinely especially obviously where the club is at now, yeah. That is that is unbelievable. And um and Yeovil at the time were was seen as the underdog. They were seen as somebody who who maybe they're not going to be successful. They got into the playoffs, nobody expected them to win. Um the rise obviously from League Two and the championship was was re- honestly ridiculous to be honest and obviously you were a heavy part of that when you obviously understood that people saw Yeovil as as underdogs and you obviously individually and all as players obviously in your team as underdogs how did you cope with that and and what did that obviously allow you to to go and do we loved it we loved it as a team like no pressure the only pressure was what we were putting on ourselves um and yet again I go back to it it's how you are as a person. Do you rise to that or do you think, oh, we're an underdog. You don't mind if we win or lose anywhere. We we had me. We had Jamie McAllister, assistant manager at Sunderland. Paddy Madden scoring all the goals. James Hater, Bournemouth legend, Doncaster legend. We had people who drove it. Gary Johnson, the manager, wouldn't let you get away with nothing. And he would tell you whether you liked it or not. Underdogs were fantastic. Chef United were in the league at that time. And um, we had them in the semi-finals. We knew we would beat them because they would un- they would underestimate us. Hundred percent, they would underestimate us, and it proved to it. We the beaters one nil at Bram- Bramall Lane, and were lucky. And then we beat them two nil at Hewish Park. And the same was with Brentford. Brentford were flying that season, playing lovely football. We and we beat them at home and away at their place in the league, and then got them in the final. And we knew we would beat them. I think Swindon were the other team in, I can't remember who they played the other, in the other semi-final, and we'd lost to them. Swindon a little a club, Yeovil a little a club, and Swindon tonked us both games, and we did not want them. Um, 
And yeah, like I say, it worked out fantastic. We knew that they would underestimate us and and we'd come out smiling. So is there anything that was going on during that time, whether it be day-to-day in training or in what was being said in meetings, how you were approaching match days, what are the biggest take-homes that, that you took from, from that period of time that still stick with you now? I remember when we were there, I'd signed for him. Um, so I had Gary Johnson at Northampton. I went there on loan. He then got sacked, went to Yeovil. So he wanted to take me. So we went there and he's like, look, it's going to be a tough season. It's going to be a scrap, but we're going to get a good squad together. Perfect. We played pre-season and he was one of them, which was fantastic. In pre-season, you'd play 10, 12 games. There was hardly any training. You were just playing games. So we'd gone into the season like, Christ, we've had our half a season anyway. First five games we won, flying. Lads are buzzing. We're going to go up here. We're happy to hit unbeaten. We then lost five on the bounce. And we're thinking, wow. So we'd gone from the emotion of happy days to, shit, we're in trouble here now. Then you see the characters come out. Then you see how the lads are going to pull together. Training never changed. Gary Johnson, it'd be still the same manager, driving everyone, being horrible, telling truths, but driving everyone, wanted it, the success. We then had Darren Ware and Terry Skiverton. Darren Ware was the one who was obsessed with football, like analysing things, telling us what's going to happen. Terry would be the one who'd be the coach and nothing changed. They didn't, they didn't get worried when we were losing. They just believed in what they were doing and drove us all on to keep doing it. And another thing was, because Yeovil's the back end of nowhere, most of the lads, if not all the lads, lived there. So we had a great source. We'd go for coffee every afternoon. We'd always be together. You know, We'd go around, eat food. We'd have the nights out together. The club was a little club, so everyone knew everyone. The office staff. I mean, kit man, the groundsman, you're all there. You'd, you'd walk around town, you'd see someone, ah, you're all right. But it was, it was just a great family club that everyone pulled in the same direction to get. What were the massive differences? I say massive. What were the differences between then the Byron Webster that started his career off as a 17-year-old at York and then the Byron Webster who was promoted through the League One playoffs into the championship with Yeovil? Experience. On and off the pitch, I knew, I knew how to deal with pressure. I knew how to deal with ups and downs. Um, obviously, I'd learnt more on the pitch, how to be a better defender, tactically, things like that. But it, everyone's going to do that. I think everyone's going to learn how to be a better footballer. But I think it's, like I said, off the pitch that you become better. And another reason, what me having kids was a massive factor for me. So, for instance, when I'd play a game, if I'd had a bad game, then I'd go home and I'd be like, "God, need to, you overthink things." As soon as I had my daughter, it was like I'd come home, I'd see her smile, and I won't think about football. Literally, it go. You know, I'm I'm now a dad. Come from a footballer to a dad within, you know, walking through the door, done. So that was a big thing for me. But I just think the older you get, the more experience you get, the more knowledgeable you are about how to deal with, it's mainly negative, negative things. Um, and like looking at it now, I'm such a black and white person. It's happened. You cannot change it. Like All you can do is now try your hardest, pull your socks up, graft your nuts off for the next game and then hopefully put it right. If it don't work again, then, you know, you analyse it, you have a look at your game, where did you go wrong? And you start again, you keep going until it will change. 100% it will change. But it's just having the strength, the belief to do that. And that is a difficult thing because, like I said, we don't, we don't set the kids up, we don't help people of how to deal with negativity. Um, and it's getting worse because of social media. I'm not on Twitter, I'm hardly ever on Instagram or anything like that because I'm not a good person to deal with Joe Blog saying I'm useless at football mate you don't know nothing about football and you're a keyboard warrior slaughtering me I would react and then I get fined react as in you would react to that person or it would make you feel a certain way I would react to the person by writing something back to him and probably 
having known how I dealt with or how I reacted to York City situation where, what's he called, Billy McEwen was a hard manager and it did affect me, it probably would affect me. So I don't put myself in them situations. I take myself away from it. Listen, when you're playing in front of crowds and someone's saying you're useless, you hear it. You know that's going to happen. You can't stop that. But I just feel like if you if you know as a person you're not you're not strong enough or you don't like to be criticised, don't go on social media because you're cream crackered then because you're going to get hammered. You think that's something that's happening now, obviously on social media and stuff, especially with young guys who, who are pretty active on, on social media, that negative press and negative comments and um, negative posts that somebody might do about a player are obviously having a massive effect on people now. It does, 100%. But younger players, or I don't want to say younger players, players love it when they get applauded, when the, you know, the positive stuff. So when yeah. the positive comes out, they retweet it. It's a million times the same thing coming. Through. And I'm thinking, I'm literally banging my head against the door going, come on, pal, we've all seen it. You don't need that self-praise. But some people do. But then when it goes the other way and you're getting hammered, then it's like, oh, well, how do they deal with this? And like, oh, it's not right. Someone's hammered me on Twitter. Yeah, but that person was, last week was saying, well done. So it, it's a catch-22. If you do not want it, don't go on it. But then when someone's praising you, you know what I mean? <laughs> they over-egg it, don't they? It's all over everywhere. I think I learned pretty quickly that like you say, f- footballers love to be loved. If you, if you get a nice praise off somebody, it makes you feel great. There's, yeah. there's no obviously there's no real substitute for that. But I can remember having just started to make minor appearances, you know, at Bournemouth when I was a kid, and my parents obviously would come to the games, and I think somebody shouted down that I was useless or this and that, and um and I actually had thought like, oh, I did all right there. Like I, f- I feel quite good about myself. I'm I'm going to go home. I was pleased. Got home, dad, mum, obviously sitting about saying, oh, how do you think the game was? I thought, yeah, I thought it was good. Dad says, oh, well, the geezer behind us was uh, was slagging you off all much. <laughs> and, I was like, and I was thinking, oh, that Opinion makes, me, sure. it makes me feel, oh, I felt yeah. so bad that I thought, like I said to him, oh, if anybody else ever abuses me around you, like, oh, I don't want to know. Like, yeah. can, you, can you not tell me? I stopped looking online at stuff because as a young guy, like you do, when you first make an appearance, you have a look, see what people are saying. Some good, some bad. Again, would only focus on the bad. So I think that's obviously a, a, a obviously a really important th- thing that you've just spoken about is that if you know that it's going to affect you, and I was, you know, probably I haven't looked at it for so long, but I f- would argue that it probably still would. Yeah. I just don't go looking for it. Yeah. I just think it's so important that you said that. I think if you have good people around you, like you said, your mum, dad, agents, friends, whatever, they tell you the truth anyway. And if you're honest to yourself, you know. You, the problem is the people who don't, who think they've had a good game when really you've been crap. Like, they're the deluded people. They're the people on Instagram, Twitter who are craving the attention. Yeah, yeah. I've never been one of them. Don't don't go on it because it's going to get affected me. Going back to a little story, might be going off song, but about fans hammering you and then saying, oh, well done. I was at a club before and um, literally my little boy had just started playing football and He's playing against a local team. Um, they play the game. My mum and dad are there. Finish, then gone to watch me play. So my mum and dad are watching the game, and afterwards I've rang him. Oh, you all right? Yeah, well done. Blah blah blah. Um, I always say to my dad, "I think I did. Sonny did well. This did this right. Did that right. Did that wrong. Blah blah blah." He says mum go. I said, "Mum, you're quiet. What's up?" She goes, oh, one of the fans has annoyed me. I said, "Oh, why?" Um, well, they were saying that you were rubbish, just like um. Like Henry, my little boy's called Henry. I said, what do you mean? Well, they'd watched Henry in the morning and were saying, no wonder his dad's rubbish if he's like that. That annoyed me because you're talking about my boy here. So I couldn't do anything about it. So, right, sweet, not a problem. Went out for food with my wife, getting the train back, and my, all my mum had said, well, the, the guy was bald with glasses. Getting on the train, the guy, a guy, group of guys come up to me and gone, Byron, well played to do today. Fantastic, we went to watch. And I looked at him and I thought, Bald glasses can't be. So I went to him, does your son play for blah, blah? He went, yeah, yeah. And I've gone from, so you've slaughtered me again. You then see me and say, well done. But then I lost my head and then I told him if you were on truth. Well, that's a different story. But do you know what I mean? It's crazy how a fan, not a keyboard warrior, but has slaughtered me and then gone, oh, well done, Byron. That's what fans are like. You know, They'll be asking for your autograph, but calling you a numpty on Twitter. 
and young guys obviously need to prepare for this in, in your opinion massively but like I said I don't know how you're going to prepare for it because like you say we all love to be loved we do but how do you deal with the negativity because as a manager it must be hard now to say listen you haven't had a good you were rubbish today you know the kids go home they go oh by the way mum dad the manager told me I was rubbish well you shouldn't be saying that you're a kid well when you get to the first team and you're playing in front of 10,000 they're going to be telling you worse than you're rubbish but how do we deal with that I think just by making people that aware that it happens yeah. is, is a forward but step. But we can tell it's them it's going it. to happen. And I think everyone knows it's going to happen. But if we're not being firm with people or being honest, and like I say, not bullying, just being honest, we're still not giving them a good enough platform to go and do it. So moving on from that, obviously, because staying on topic, when you played for Millwall, you signed for Millwall, Obviously, the outside perception of, of being a Millwall player is that it's a difficult environment to be in. It's a lot of pressure. Um, like, if you don't win games, like you say, you, you, you get abused. Like, it's, there's, there's no two ways about it. So, how did you eventually be able to... Obviously, you were part of a massively successful Millwall team. And, obviously, you've touched on that your experiences in the past helped you to be able to deal with that pressure. But can you go into a little bit more detail about, you know, what the sort of things that you were going through mentally, physically... How did you manage to, to go out and perform week in, week out for obviously a team that just demands that, that you win? Well, to start off with, it didn't go well. So, Yeovil, we got promoted, played a year in the championship, then we got relegated. So, my contract was up. So, I spoke to a few clubs, blah, 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 signed at Millwall. Ian Holloway was a manager, one of the best managers I played under. Him and Sean O'Driscoll, fantastic managers. Um, the only thing with Ian Holloway was what you see on TV is what he's like. He's such an intense guy. Um, went there. He's brought me in. So I'm thinking, happy days. If this manager has wanted me to come here when I've had other options, I'm going to be playing, surely. Came in and I wasn't. And I'm thinking, hey, what's happening here? So literally speaking to my dad and my agent, I'm going, he's not having me, you know. I'm, I'm not playing here. Nah, of course he has. He's brought you in, blah, blah, blah. So things were happening, playing games, getting subbed off, playing games, not playing the next game. And yet again, go back to it, mentally, I had to be so strong. I had to be. I had A, a thing I'd do, I'd surround, my people with, surround myself with good people, um, trustworthy. I'm a very trustworthy guy. If, you, if I trust you, you're in with me. You know? If not, then you just push to one side. Um, and that's why my circle's so small. But, yeah, I think it was after... I'd only been there six months, and then in January I went back to on loan to Yeovil because I weren't playing. So after that, I went back to Yeovil, came back in the summer. Um, Ian Holloway had got sacked, and Neil Harris was in charge. And I'm thinking, listen, Millwall fans hate me. There's no chance I'm going to come back and play. Uh, Neil Harris said, listen, you ain't going anywhere, you're playing. So... Fair enough then, happy days playing. So then, so I've gone from a new player, obviously the fans are thinking happy days, so I've gone from higher, I've then not done so well, so I've gone even, I'm rock bottom now. So any mistake, the fans are going to jump on it. One million percent, like you say, Millwall fans. The only good thing about Millwall fans, compared to other fans, is that they are honest. If they think you're rubbish, they ain't coming up to you in the car park and going, oh, well done today, they're telling you <laughs> you're rubbish. Um, but because I got through that, because I was mentally strong, because I was, I grafted and all I did was I was just me. I stuck to being me and, and give my all. I then won them over and then I kept winning them over. Performances were getting better. Confidence was getting better. I was playing more games and then they're actually, they're chanting your name and then they're asking for autographs and then it's, and do you know what I mean? Then you, the snowball effect of, right, I'm actually liked here. Then we got to the final, I got injured in the final, we lost it. And then the next year we won and we got promoted. And then, I'd say I'm a legend, but I'm, I'm liked a lot by Millwall fans. I still get stopped by them now, it, you know, it, it's happy days. But at the start, it was rubbish. Physically, and what do, the training was always the same, Joe. I've, it's always been one where, like I say, you graft hard for the two hours you're training. And then afterwards, the only difference between Yeovil and Millwall was there was more staff at Millwall, more money, so we had better resources, better facilities, things like that. 
Um, so you were looked after a lot, lot more. Um, for instance, cryo chambers, things like that. Your protein was ready. Your food was better. Things like that. You'd stepped up a standard. So it was all there for you. But I think the training throughout any club is more or less the same. It's just possessions, isn't it? Passing drills. You have your five O's, your shape. I think it's the managers that make the difference and obviously the standard of players that are there. I think in most teams, obviously, in, in this day and age, there's so many people that play football in so many teams and so many age groups that obviously not everybody plays. And just as you touched on there, obviously, you spent a period of time when you were in and out of the team. You felt, you know, obviously negative about the position that you were in. You're talking about sticking to, to your own beliefs, working hard. But I wonder if you can just share with us in a, in a little bit more detail because people, hopefully people listen to this podcast, a lot of people will be going through the same stuff. In and out of teams, not sure if the manager's having me, not sure if the supporters of the club are, are, are really into me. That brings its own pressure. Suddenly you start to possibly play within yourself, you start to find it more difficult to be successful. You went through that and you came out the other side. So I wonder if you can go, like I've just said, into a little bit more detail about what specifically you were doing day to day, how you were approaching match days, how you were approaching appearances that allowed you to obviously go through that and then come out as, as like you're saying, as, as somebody who more fans respect and like. Yeah. Going off track a little bit, I had a phone call the other day from a young lad who used to be at Bromley, who's gone to a league club now, who's, who's injured. He hasn't got through his injury. And he literally rang me and says, Byron, how did you get through your injuries? How do you stay positive? What do you do? And I literally went through him and said, as long as you are giving yourself every opportunity to be fit or to play games, that's all you can do. You're injured at the minute, so you're going to trust the physios. After that, you then have to look after yourself. Are you doing the training to the best ability? Are you doing your recovery? Are you going out having a drink on a weekend when you shouldn't be? You're injured. Your body needs to recover. All them things add up to it. Off the pitch then, I said to him, what are you doing off the pitch? He goes, Byron, I'm bored out my head. Well, that's a problem. You've got to find something. Are you going to sit down and watch TV series? There's more TV series, movies, documentaries than anything. Watch them. Do you want to do a course online? You know, there's so much that we can do as footballers or as people to occupy the mind. Our problem is, especially footballers, we're lazy. You know, we train hard. We think, oh, I've trained hard for two hours now. Now I'm going to go and put my feet up at home. I'm going to rest. Yeah, you do need to, but you can also keep your mind occupied. Me at at Millwall, when I was going through my challenges or tough times it was more it, listen it is tough and I think more at Millwall because the players were from higher clubs so if I aren't training well <laughs> you're just getting told and it is a, it, it, I go back to it, it's a sink or swim situation where are you going to let this one person or two whoever it is let, let these people affect you or are you going to Put, get the bite between your teeth and go, I can do this. And and you you do it. You, you you go and do it. And then when you've done it, it's like, yes, I am someone. I'm part of this team. And and I think players respect that a lot. When you They've seen you go through a tough time. It could be you've been out and injured a long time and you've come back and, do you know what? He's been in the gym for two months and look at him now. He's come back, he's flying. Or he, he, he's been rubbish for a month. And look at him now, he's back to what he is. And it, it, the lads respect you more for that. Um, but I, honestly, I can't nail down what I did or what I changed because I'm a very simple person. I'm a very simple footballer. Do you know what I mean? I don't overcomplicate things or overcomplicate life. Um, I know what I'm good at at football, so I will work on them things. So I'm a defender. I'm going to head it and kick it. Right, so... What I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure when I edit, I edit as far as I can. If I can pass it, I'm going to give it to better players. So my player, I spoke to him about you today, Willow, Sean Williams was the best player I played with. So every time I get the ball, my job is easy. Get the ball and give it to him. He can do more than I can do. I know what I'm good at. I think people, when they get into bad situations or off form, they overcomplicate it. Oh, I need to do this. I need to do that. No, you don't. You need to do the opposite of that. You need to literally simplify your game. Get it? Give it to people who can play it. Chris Brass used to say a fantastic one. He used to say, as he used to go, Brassy, you've had a good career, haven't you? He goes, yeah, yeah. Why is that then? 
well, because I know what I am. I says, what do you mean? He goes, well, I'm a piano pusher and there's piano players. I says, what do you mean? He goes, well, I'm not good enough to play it, but I'll push the piano for the players. And that's what it is. I know what I'm good at. I will push the piano for the good players, give them the ball, and you piano players, go and play. You go and do what you want to do. And I think that's what it is. Managers should say, if you're out of form, simplify your game, get in credit, pass the ball simple, and then, as everyone's on about stats now, your stats will be higher. <laughs> so going back to playing under pressure, there's something I'm quite interested in because a lot of guys, as we've touched on, we've touched on trialists, we've touched on people out of form, we've touched on successful teams and underdog teams. Everybody plays under different circumstances, under different pressure. How can people who are at clubs with invo- involved in environments that are expected to win, like you say you were at Millwall every week, how can they prepare for those games and those feelings? It's a tough one because you use me as an example at Millwall, but the top, top players don't deal with pressure all the time. You can use Rashford. We, listen, we don't know what's happening with Rashford at the minute, but you'd say a lot of pressure is on his shoulders as a young lad. He's still a very young lad. He's come from the Euros where he's missed a penalty. He's then gone into Man United's team. His form's not to the, what it is. So his problem is that his standards were sky high. Now, because he dipped a little bit low, below, not massively below, everyone's on him. So how you deal with pressure, I don't think there's, if there was a right answer for that, there'd be no pressure in football. The fact is that it's how that individual, how you as an individual deal with it. My way for dealing it was, <laughs> I had kids. <laughs> I'm not saying for everyone to go and have kids, but I had kids. So I played a game, went home, finished. Never thought about football. So it was sweet. There was no pressure. Literally, my pressure, the only pressure I ever felt was I have a few superstitions. If I don't get my superstitions in before a game, and then as soon as I was on a pitch, as soon as the whistle went, all my feelings went out of my head. I don't remember any games. I don't remember how I played. I don't remember. So I was literally talking to that, my dad about it the other day. The Wembley games I played in, don't remember any of them. Couldn't tell you anything about it. He goes, well, you not watched it back? I says, nah, nah, I am to be fair. I will do sooner or later. But And I, that's just me as an individual. Um, so as soon as I'm in the battle, the game... I don't feel pressure because I don't feel anything. I don't know why it is. I'm just in a zone. I'm, I'm, I'm out of there. The pressure is, like I say, maybe if you read something online and you see someone slaughtering you or, oh, this week we're going to play against Man United. Oh, well, we're only Millwall. Like, we're going to lose, blah, 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 blah. And that was it. I, I, that's how I dealt with pressure. I, I didn't read, read anything. And then when it came to the games, in the games... It weren't a problem because I didn't, re- I didn't remember anything. We've touched on it a little bit already earlier in the conversation um, when I was asking you about your outstanding attributes and how you managed to improve your game whilst at Yeovil and, and we spoke about recovery being a big deal, um, obviously, to you. A lot of people hopefully listening to this podcast will be you know, young guys trying to improve their game to, to make a career in football, but hopefully a lot of people listening already are having a career in football. Um, and will want to find ways of obviously continuing that career long into in into I say old age, but I mean thirties now is arguably the, the the time to retire. You're 34, and and you've still you've played every minute of every game this season. You've played to an incredibly high level, in my opinion, one of the outstanding performers in our team this year. Um, how have you managed to stay involved in the game as well as you have done um, at an age where other players haven't been able to sustain a career? Um, wanting it uh, you know like I said um, after I left Carlisle um, it was a lockdown and you know I, I was really really close to retiring like really close to the point where yet again my dad said Byron you've got all your life to work just enjoy football play as long as you can um, and that's why I ended up at Bromley because opportunities came that I passed up on because I weren't bothered um, came to Bromley and yet again reignited my love for the game of football um, so that's the first thing you have to want to keep playing because it, it is tough you know it's not necessarily just physically but there's no set it's for your family mainly for my family so I'm away from my family a lot but also you know we could say we'd have Sunday Monday off 
we have a bad result. We're in Sunday, Monday, so it affects the family life. How do they deal with it? Can you deal with your wife getting angry with you because you're not at home or things like that? So I have, I have, I'm lucky I have that sorted off the pitch. Going back to physically, I do look after myself. I, you know, I'll be doing my stretches. I'll be going to the gym for sauna, jacuzzi, swim, whatever it is. But also I go back to the people I trusted throughout my career who who have got the best out of me. So like I say, when I was at Donny and I was skinny, I trusted Ross Burberry to bulk me up. He bulked me up and physically I'm, I'm fine now. So if there's ever a problem, I can always ring him. I can always ring him and touch base with him. Um, he'll send me programs through. He'll help me out. Or literally, I save all his programs. I printed them all out, laminated them all. And if I need to, I'll go back to him. Physios are the same. If I ever have a problem from a club, I'll contact a physio and say, look, listen, this is wrong with me. I'm tight here. What should I do? And I, I just think throughout football, you come across people that you trust, you believe in. They believed in you and you've seen results. So you'll go back to them and they will help you out. So how important are you, in your opinion is that players build relationships with people that they trust? And not just, I'm not talking about teammates, but I'm talking about practitioners. I'm talking about like yeah. whether it be nutritionists, sports psychologists, physios, whoever it might be, that they build those relationships from trust and then obviously stick to that, their career. Yeah, it's massive. Like I say, I'm a, I'm a loyal person who only wants loyalty from teammates or staff or whatever you want to class it as. And if you're sure that, and I see results from the work me and say the sports scientists are doing, it plants a seed in my head, I trust you. I've seen results from it, you know, I will trust you forever then. And I think that's, well, that's the main thing for me. I saw results from Ross when I did my ACL, the work that Lawrence Bloom and uh, Paul Tanner, the physio, the results I saw from it, I will well, number one, forever grateful to him. And number two, they put too much, so much effort in to get me back fit that, you know, I will never speak a bad word about them. And three, they were always there for me. So there's, yeah, there's only a handful of people that, well, there's a handful of friends, true friends, I believe, in everyone's life that you trust. And a handful of people, staff-wise, in, um, in football that you can trust and you, you will believe in. And yeah, I've been fortunate that I've found some good people that I do. But going back to it, I also believe that if you see a program or a show or what they call podcast or stretching online and you see a positive result in your body or you feel better, you will keep doing that. It doesn't matter if you do it for, if you do it when you're 20, I guarantee you carry it on until you're 35, until you're retired or 40, whatever you are. You, you will do. We're just, cre- what's it, creatures of habit? Is that the right word? That we keep doing the same things until we find something else new. Oh, yeah, well, I did this stretching and I felt better, so I'm going to keep doing that. Or, do you know what, before a game, I do 10 headers. All right, I'm going to keep doing 10 headers. And striker, yeah, I need to do 10 shots before a game and score 10 goals and I feel better. We're just weirdos. That's how we are. We, we find something, we find someone, and we stick with them. I'm glad you knew that this was a podcast. But yeah, I know, yeah. I <laughs> appreciate it. Um, your role at the moment, Byron at Bromley, is captain. Um, you have done it, obviously, at so many of your clubs. Uh, having known you for a little bit of a time now, obviously the pair of us are close before meeting you. I've asked your agent, obviously, about you. told me what kind of guy you are. Um, technical and physical ab- ability aside, you give great information both, you know, on and off the pitch. Um, teammates, staff members, whoever it might be. A lot of people go to you for advice. Um, They go to you with problems that you can help them with. I'm wondering, for people who may not have these attributes uh, within their personality but would like them, have you always been, you know, somebody that can give good advice but that people trust, that people go to as a leader and and that is outspoken and and that people listen to? Or did you have to learn to do that? Um, my dad's always been one who's saying, whenever I've played, he's always be, be the gobby one. Make sure people hear you. Make sure people know. And I think that was mainly when I was growing up. So scouts or coaches would recognise you. Because like you said, there's so many players who go under the radar of you know the good players, but 
they don't say boo to a goose, you know, and the, nothing comes of them. So if I'm the gobby one, the first thing someone's going to say, oh, well, Byron Webster's a mouthy one. So I've always been one who would talk. But the more you play football, the higher up you get or the, the more you in like deeper you get within a team, people work you out. If you're talking a load of waffle, they're going to be like, he's just talking rubbish. Don't listen to him. So I, I have been a student of the game. I've listened to people. I've worked under a few managers who have good ideas. So, you know, you, you pinch that, you take it to one side. Um, so when I do talk about football, I, I, I feel like I do have a little bit of understanding. But on the other hand, if someone, Luke Coulson's a good friend of ours, he's very, he's a, well, a massive student of the game. So if he was to say, nah, Byron, I don't agree with you, I won't be like, nah, 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 nah. I'm right, you're wrong. You know, I, I played for Millwall, I've done this. I'm not like that. I will listen to him. So even though you're saying people come and speak to me, I'm still learning. I still listen to people. I still, my opinion isn't gospel. So, you know, I still I still want to learn. I still want to see other sides of things. Um, but that's footballing-wise. Off the field, I think because I've been through moving abroad at a young age, I'm older than a lot of people now. I've experienced more. I've got kids and whatever else that the younger lads do come to you and ask for your opinion. But also I go back to it. I think it is because of I have had success at higher level that they will come and speak to me because there's more, I don't want to say more respect, but do you know what I mean? There's like a more, well, probably is they respect me more because they think I've done more. You know, I could be a numpty. But because I, I give them the time of day and I'm respectful that I do try and help people. And if I can't help, I will then say, I think you should go and speak to the manager or I think you should go and speak to whoever. Um, I will always try and do that. And I go back to it at York City where I earned my stripes. I, you know, if a first team player spoke to you as a young lad at York City, I would be buzzing. So then when I did get into the, into the first team at a young age and they were speaking to me, I could speak to them. You know, I could ask them their advice. I, they, they'd help me. Paul Groves, the best at it when, I don't even know he's a manager of now, but he's had a few jobs. He just left Gloucester, I think. Was he, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. I, I ain't seen him for, he must be nearly. He was my manager for a while. Was he? He must he's be. F- basically the only Bournemouth manager who picked me, actually. Was he? <laughs> Nose talent. Nose yeah. talent. Or, uh, yeah, or doesn't. He doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so he must be 15 years since I've seen him. But he was fantastic with me. Like, literally, I remember we were playing cards one day on the bus, and he came up to me and went, move. I says, what do you mean I'm playing cards? No, you're not. You're 17-year-old. Get down there. I was like, all right, then. You know what I mean? He's given me that advice. You are not gambling. Get away from it. And little things like that. And, like, he'd always come to, are you all right? Yeah? You making sure you got a lift home? You're okay? Weren't driving? It, it was fantastic. So if a young lad's going to come to me and ask for my advice, Byron, can I have a word? One million percent you can. I would never be the person who'd go, nah, see you later, pal. I want to see the young lads progress. I want them to have a career. If they can have half a career or whatever they want to do, it's fantastic. My problem is the young lads that don't and they think they've cracked it, they annoy the hell out of me. So do you think your experiences obviously have, have shaped you in a way that you now can give advice? Or Because what I'm trying to get is I hope that people don't listen to this and just think I'm going to start giving people advice because I want to play that role. Like if a young player said to you, Byron, I think you should be a little bit higher on goal kicks or Byron, I don't think you're necessarily that good at yeah. diags. I don't think you should yeah. do that. Do you know what I mean? Like, well, at, at what point do you, do you become able to give advice? Like for, uh, I'm trying to black and white it for people, yeah, for people I, listening. It's tough, isn't it? Because if you look at Wayne Rooney, when he was 16, 17, 18, he was bellowing at everyone. He didn't care. And maybe he could do it because he was, he was doing it on the pitch. So it goes back to, again, respect. The, the players, going back to the try list. If a try list comes in and he's chirpy as anything and he's not doing anything, on, you know, he's messing up at training, come on, mate, get away. If he's coming on and he's ripping it up and he's doing well and he says, by the way, Byron, when I get the ball, make sure you're higher up or drop down for me. I go, yeah, no problem, pal. Age-wise, 
we've all been there. If there's some chirpy little kid who comes on and he goes to you, Byron, I think you're too deep. Mate, do me a favour, get away. <laughs> but I think me, I'd be, I would be thinking, do one, young man. But then I'd be thinking, all right, am I? I wouldn't let him know, but I'd be like, all right, then, yeah, no problem. Would I get higher up? Maybe not, but <laughs> but yeah, it, like I say, it goes down to it, what the players like on the pitch, and if you're a respectful person. Um, and my my main things on the pitch is if if someone's working hard and they tell me something, I will listen to him. If you ain't working hard and you're telling me I'm too deep, no chance I'm listening to you. Before we get on to to finishing up, mate, as obviously you know, I've touched on it as a 34 year old now. What advice would you have for young guys about how to approach first team players or first team players? You might be a young first team player. How can you approach people for advice? Like, do you, do you think that's a positive thing if they were go to go to somebody for advice? I do, yeah. But I, I think that I think a first team player would be more. In, no, I think most first team players. If a young man came up to you and says, "Oh, can I have a word with you?" I think majority of players would say yes. But I think if the younger lads was to say, morning, for instance. You're walking by a first-team player. Morning, you all right? He plants a seed in any first-team player's head. And they're like, oh, who's that? And you talk, oh, that's blah, blah. The next morning, morning, yeah, you are all right, Joe? Yeah, yeah, not bad. And then by the time you work his, the young lad's name out, yeah, you are all right, Byron? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, then you get a relationship. Then he's like saying, oh, do you want your boots cleaning? Yeah, no problem, mate. Brings you your boots. And then you get a bond, you get a relationship. And then then they feel free. They, they'll ask you anything. Um, and like I said, that's the problem now with how it was when we were back in the day to what it is now. There's not, there's not a relationship many with the young kids. The only relationship you get is when they get moved into the first team. The big squads, Man United, whatever, I bet the academies at one base and the first team at the other, there's no mixing. So... How are they going to ever go and ask a first team player for advice? How are they going to get advice? How, what's it like to play in front of 90,000 people? Well, we can't ask anyone because they're at a different base. You know, you, you get that experience when, go on, by the way, you're making your debut today. <laughs> Cheers. Um, so, yeah, for me, it, the young lads, it would be great if they, yeah, if they had the confidence. And that's another thing. Do the young lads have the confidence to come up to a first team player and go, oh, by the way, Byron, can I have a word with you? Not many will. But if we get that relationship, we get the young lads speaking to the first team players or to the senior players, whatever it is, I think it will help the young lads massively. So finishing up, mate, I've, you know, we've obviously been close for a long time. I actually had a conversation with the, with the kit man just before this about, I've had so many questions I've wanted to ask you about your career and I've held off for ages <laughs> because of this podcast. I wanted to get them out in this, but what piece of advice would you give to a young Byron Webster if you were able to speak to him right now? What advice would I give to him? Believe in yourself. I've got a tattoo saying believe. Um, never worry about other, opinion, other people's opinion that don't affect you. So what I mean by that is, like, if I keep saying Joe Bloggs. If Joe Bloggs is down the street and he's saying you're rubbish, don't even worry about it. Listen to your dad, your wife, your brothers, your sisters, your flaming grandparents, your friends who are close to you, who know you. If they say something, it means something. And that's the main thing for me. Just believe, believe in yourself and listen to people close to you. And would your advice, what piece of advice would you give to young players who are aspiring to become professional footballers? Would it be similar? or, or would It'd be similar, yeah. Say? Surround yourself with, with good people, good family. Because it, as soon as you become a footballer, you'll have loads of mates. And they ain't your mates. Just be, have your friends around you and it's happy days um, because they will be honest with you. And going back to it, the football's full of opinions, isn't it? And no one has the same one. So, you know, if someone says they don't like you, yeah, no problem. There will be someone who likes you as a footballer. Never get too low and never get too high. Nice way to finish, Byron. Thank you very much, Thank mate. Very Appreciate much, your David. time, giving Brilliant. us an insight into your experiences and your career. Fantastic. All good. Thank you very Just much, mate. Just glad to see you, sir. <laughs> Vamos. <laughs>